have the privilege of bringing to a close the sermon series that Pastor Dion started at the beginning of this year on Romans chapter 8 called The Greatest Chapter. This chapter is 39 verses. So far, we've covered the first 30, and I have the responsibility of closing this thing down by preaching the final eight verses. Has this been good for you all so far? I'm going to give you a quick little two-minute two recap. A, a lot of people view chapter 8 as a declaration of freedom, a declaration of freedom in your life, that if you are living in Christ, you have access to a life of freedom. And this chapter 8 is the declaration of the freedom that you get. He starts by saying, you are free from judgment. And Pastor Dion preached on, there is no condemnation in Christ, you've been set free. Now, there's a difference, by the way, between a consequence to your action and condemnation for your action, but you'll have to go back and listen to Pastor Dehan's sermon for that. So he said, you're free from judgment. Then he went on to say, you're free from defeat and that you don't have any oblig obligation or duty or commitment to earn your salvation. Sharif preached about that and said, it's not a blessed insurance that you have, but it's a blessed what? Do you remember? Assurance. EOP, EOP. You got to watch the... Watch the series back if you didn't get in on the joke. <laughs> then Pastor Dehan over the last two weeks preached about, the, uh, preached about the idea of being free from discouragement, free from frustration. There's no pain, or even in pain and suffering, because we share in the glory of God. We're free from discouragement with the confidence that, do you guys remember the promise that Pastor Dehan said? You need to remember this. God works all things together for the good of those who love him. Do you all remember that? Did you write it down? Put it on your mirror? Been saying that promise to yourself every morning? No? Okay, let's make that our secret. Don't tell Pastor Dehan that you didn't do what he said last week. That brings us to Romans 8.31, and I want to preach from the title, Free at Last. Will you say that back to me? Free at Last. But today I want to do it a little bit differently than I normally preach. I want to, I want to teach it to you more like a Bible study. I want to go verse by verse than... I preach it to you, although there may be moments when I get a little excited up here. Just, to, just don't mind me. I just, I just love reading the Bible. I love preaching it to you. So let's talk about it. So in verse 31, Paul begins his closing eight verses, and he says this. What then shall we say to these things? Okay, now that I've given you 30 verses, I've told you you're, you're free from judgment, you're free from defeat, you're free from discouragement. What do we make of all this? What then shall we say to these things? And he offers us five things. Here's the first. I don't have it, so you got to flip it. If God is for us. <laughs> I, it's only so big. I only have so much room here. I can't have all the. If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Here's the second. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Amen. Come on, we need to say amen after all these. Let's go to number three. This is verse 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Amen. Let's go to 34. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Amen. Here's the fifth one. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Okay, here's his conclusion. Those five things, supporting argument, here's my conclusion. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Come on, you should be happy about that. You are more than a conqueror through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, present nor future, or any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Y'all ready to do this? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to speak to this community. I pray, Lord, that it will be your words flowing through me, God. Empower me by the Holy Spirit to deliver the message that you have for these people, God. I pray that you will give them the ears to hear and the hearts and the souls to digest your word, that it would make them better, that it would make them more like you, that they would leave encouraged today, inspired to live a life of freedom. Amen. There's a fundamental 
premise about who Jesus is that is really important to understanding the closing eight verses of chapter eight. And it's that Jesus knows you, Jesus loves you, and he exists to give you life. And the thing about it is you don't need to know Jesus in order for him to know you. The creator always knows the creation. You, you don't need to love Jesus in order for him to love you. There may be days where, where you don't feel like loving God, but you know what? That does not change the way that he feels about you. And in John 10, 10, Jesus says, I have come that they or you might have life. Jesus wants you to live life. He doesn't want you to just be alive. He wants you to grow. He wants you to create. He wants you to be excited, enthusiastic, and full of strength and good energy. He wants you to be alive. He wants every part of your existence to be full of life, not just your relationship with him. He wants your relationships with the rest of humanity to be alive and growing. He wants you professionally to be flourishing. He wants you emotionally strong and ready to go. He wants you to be full of life. He wants you doing the things that make you feel alive. He wants you doing the things that you're passionate about and full of life. And he wants your life to be full of excitement. He wants you to be connected to humanity. He wants you to go on adventures and take risks. He wants you to laugh and love and cry and hug it out and not live in fear. He wants you to be alive. And that's why, that's why we spend a lot of time on Sunday mornings making sure that the environment that we create in this church is one that we are alive. Because we're not here mourning the, resurrection, the crucifixion. We're here celebrating the resurrection. We're not getting together on Sunday mornings, having a funeral service, sad and mourning the fact that Jesus died. We're coming together to celebrate the fact that he is risen. And the same resurrection power that is in Christ is now in us. We want to be alive. And, and he, doesn't, he doesn't want you to just be alive and kind of exist in, in, in somewhat of a mediocre way and like not disturb anybody and just kind of float through life. He says, I have come that you may have life and have it what? To the fullest or have it more abundantly. He wants you to push life to its limits. He doesn't want you to be afraid to try new things. He wants you to feel the thrill of taking a risk and being alive, at least until you have children, because then it's all over. <laughs> it's all over. I'm kidding. It's a new kind of life. He wants you, Jane, what I'm talking about. <laughs> he wants you to be alive. But the reason that Jesus needs to come and give life is because there's an opposite force trying to take your life. And I'm not trying to be dramatic, okay? I'm not trying to be dramatic. And as, as much as we want to believe that the universe is kind of this neutral third party out there that's just going to let naughty and nice play itself out, and if you put some nice out there, you'll get nice back, and if you're naughty, then you get not, not. No, the Bible is very clear to the point that before Jesus even says, I have come that you may have life, he prefaces it with this statement. There is a thief that has come to kill steal and destroy, but I have come that you might have life. The Bible is very clear about this in the same way that there is a good God generously and graciously trying to give you life. There is a thief that is trying to steal, kill, and destroy that life. Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter 5, 8. He says, the devil prowls like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Seeking someone to not discourage, not disrupt, not bother, not intimidate, devour. And the tension that we live with in life is this. How do we live the life that God wants us to give us while battling the thief? How do we live the life that God wants, us, wants to give us while battling the thief? And what can happen so many times is we end up living so bound up in fear because we're afraid of what's going to happen. We're scared to step out of our comfort zone. We're scared to take a risk that we live in bondage. We live bound instead of living in the freedom that God has for us. In Paul, in chapter 8, 
makes a declaration of freedom. And he closes the argument in verses 31 through 39 with five points that ends in the triumphant statement that says you are more than a conqueror. More than conqueror. The way that it translates is basically like a super conqueror. Super conqueror. So I want to explain to you these five points, hoping that you understand what it means to live in freedom and that you will be, come on, say it with me, free at last. Y'all ready for point one? All right, I'll keep going on the introduction. All right. <laughs> Y'all ready for point one? <laughs> Verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Here's your first place of freedom. I am free from fear. God is for you. If you're taking notes, write these five down. Remember, you are free from fear. God is for you. Can I tell you something? All that God is, all that God has, all that God does is for you. God is pro you. He is advocating for you. He is supportive of you. He is loving you. He is for you. I look at it like this. The other day I was playing basketball at the gym. And just pick up basketball. So you got about 10, 15 guys at the gym. You pick two teams of five. You play to like 11. And this is like a, this is not intense, okay? This is just guys over 30 trying to get a little cardio and not injure themselves. Because that's really what sports is about when you're over 35. Is as long as I don't get hurt, I'm good. So we're playing this civilized game of basketball, but there's a problem which is where two or more male egos are gathered, there is <laughs> dysfunction. And so some guy on the other team starts talking a little bit of trash. I'm cool with that. I've played a lot of basketball. There's been a lot of trash talk. I don't have a problem, Sharif, if you want to talk a little bit of trash, okay? <laughs> it wasn't Sharif, by the way. It wasn't Sharif. It wasn't Sharif. I just happened to look at him. But I got two, I got two things that I keep in mind. One, are you talking to me? And this guy, this guy broke rule number one. He started talking to me, so I engaged in a highly civilized discussion with him on the court. And then there's rule number two, which is there's just a line, man. There's just a line, okay? We're just guys playing basketball. Don't cross it. And he had to go ahead and cross the line. And I'd just been listening to too much Justin Timberlake, so I had to say something. And, and now this guy that I just wanted to play a little pickup, now this guy's my enemy. I want you to lose. I don't want you to score. I don't want you to touch the ball. I want you to leave frustrated and disappointed that you ever came to the gym today. I said, hey, Romans 8.31, if God is for me, who could be against me? And guess what? God was for me, and we won. But it... But it's all good. It's all good. After the game, you know, we shake hands. We reconcile. It's all good. You know, just guys being guys. And so we go to play the next game. But this funny thing happens is out of the five guys on my team, one had to leave. And, and so what you do is you kind of look around the gym, and you're like, can anybody, is anybody available to play? And one hand goes up. Guess who it is? <sighs> okay. So now this guy's on my team. And... It's interesting, my kind of relational arc with this guy, because he went from my enemy to being, okay, we're cool, man, we're reconciled, to now he's on my team, which means I'm for you, bro. Like, like when you score, we win. Like, when I score, we all win. Like, I want you to do well now. I'm, I'm working together with you to achieve a common goal. Like, we are on the same team. And I think it's true about a relationship with God. We start as an enemy of God. We are sinners saved by grace. All have fallen short of the glory of God. But then God in his great mercy sends his son Jesus to die on the cross and forgive us of our sins. And in that action, he reconciles our relationship with him. And we are now at peace with God where we were once enemies. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. But my fear is that our relationship with God never matures past this point. And, and, and we go, okay, now I'm good with God. He's forgiven my sins. Let me just not do anything stupid to disrupt that. Let me act in a way that when God looks over and checks in on me, he knows I'm being a good Christian. 
He knows I'm doing the right things. And let me not do anything too bad that he might change his mind about this whole reconciliation and peace thing. But can I, can I teach you a little bit about more about what the Bible says? Because the Bible doesn't say that God just reconciles us. It says he goes a step further and adopts us as his sons and daughters, which means when you declare salvation in the name of Jesus Christ, you are now team Jesus. He is for you. He is pro you. He is working for you. When you win, he wins. He is wishing with everything in him that you do well. You are on team Jesus. He is advocating for you. He's defending you. And I love how he, he asked the question, like, if God is for us, who can be against us? Like, like what, what a thing to say. Like, who amongst you can be against us? And I think you just have to level set that for a minute, okay? Because we're not talking about a God who's like a lucky charm. It's not a rabbit's foot. It's not, a, it's not a genie in the bottle. It's not a statue, an inanimate object. We are talking about the creator of the universe, the king of all kings, the alpha and the omega, the author and finisher of our faith, who determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. This is the God that is for you. Amen? I want you to wake up every morning in the freedom that God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Amen? Let's go to number two. Verse 32. He says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will, we not all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Here's your second point of freedom. You are free from worry. God will provide. You are free from worry. God will provide. You see, Christ was not just given in exchange for us. He was given to us. Oftentimes, we can view Jesus as the guy who reached into the lake and saved us while we were drowning, but then kind of dries us off and says, you good? Okay, I'll see you later. I'll be over here. He, he doesn't merely reach down into hell and save us of our sins, to save us from death, to kind of encourage us, and then leave. He saves us and then stays with us. He goes where you go. He walks where you walk. And, 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 and God's love is so genuine that he doesn't force himself on you. He just stays right there. He says, I'm here if you need it. I, I, I know a thing or two. I've seen a thing or two. I know where you're going to be in 20 years. I, I know the names of your children. I, I know what schools they're going to go to and what year they graduate and who they marry. I know your husband, by the way. I know the dress you're going to wear on your wedding day. I, I know how you're going to find your next place to live. I, I know your next employer. I know what you're going to be doing in 15 years. I, I know that it really bothers you, but, 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 but I know I, I, kind of, I kind of exist outside of time. Like I, I, I actually am the, the beginning, the middle, and the end. I am everything. But listen, I, I'm just here if you need me. You're going to go over there? Okay. You're going to make a bad decision? I'm going with you. Okay, that's not what I would have done with my life, but if that's what you want to choose, let's go. I'm here. I'm here. All you got to do is ask. Everything that he has is at your disposal. He's not stingy. He's not petty. And, and you might say, okay, that's cool, man, but that's that, that's that Christian hyperbole. Oh, yeah, all God's love is for me. Well, this is how I look at it. In life, what isn't tested can't be trusted. And in the very statement, he who did not spare his own son, while you were an enemy of God, he gave you his most precious belonging. While you were an enemy. How much more will he give you now that you are his sons and daughters? He has been tested, and he can be trusted. What do you need from God? Healing? Peace of mind, parenting skills, reconciliation, strength, courage. Are you afraid to ask? God is not superficial and shallow in this request. It says he graciously gives all things. You know what that means? That's the difference between McDonald's and Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong in about 30 seconds. 
When you go to McDonald's, not that I do because I'm super healthy. <laughs> what do they say when they hand you your Happy Meal? You're welcome. You're welcome. That's, that's Moana. Um, I, didn't hit the, I didn't hit the right. No. They give because they're paid to give and they have to give. But when you go to Chick-fil-A, what do they say? My pleasure. They give because they want to give to you. They want to hand you that crispy chicken goodness, number one, with the Chick-fil-A sauce, Mike. Come on. Who's going after church today? That was your test to see who. We have a strong, strong people today. See, when, when you ask of God, he's not like, oh, man, really, you going to bother me with that request? You're going to bother me with having a good day? There's 365 days in a year. You're going to bother me with making a couple more of them good? Ah, you're welcome. It brings him joy to provide for you. It makes him happy. It makes him smile. It brings God pleasure to serve you and to lift you up and to provide for you. He graciously and freely wants to give you all things. And just as a quick point of clarification, this does not mean he will give it. Because sometimes you ask for things that you think are good for you, but they're really bad for you. And when you ask of God something, he filters it through the lens of what is actually good and best for you and then gives that back through you. Let's keep it moving. Number three, verse 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Number three, point of freedom. You are free from judgment. God sees you as righteous. When God looks at you, he sees you as righteous. He sees you as holy. He sees you as pure. He sees you as worthy. Not because of what you did, but because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, died the death that we should have died. And now when Jesus, when God looks at you, he sees the perfect holiness of his son, Jesus. And this... This is such a pivotal point in being victorious in life because so many times we are our own worst accusers. Like, like for, forget our friends and family that like to, you know, accuse us of things or like coworkers or just the world in general. Sometimes we can't even get out of our own heads. And, and we're just accusing ourselves of stuff like, oh, man, I'm just lazy and I can't, you know, just mean, I'm just a worthless person, like I don't have what it takes, or I'm not good enough, or I'm not, I'm too ugly, we just accuse, okay, in our own heads, and some of us can never, and listen, I, sometimes that, that, that stuff is true, okay, sometimes that, those things are true, and it's okay, we, we, we all have things that we're working on, we're, we're all a work in progress, but where this becomes problematic is when you start to accuse yourself so much that you begin to believe that those accusations are inherently who you are and there is no way forward from it. And then so instead of just feeling like you're lazy, you say, I am lazy. I can't overcome that. I won't amount to that. And there's no way that I can. And that causes us to live in shame and guilt. And... When you're living in shame and guilt, you almost start to apologize for the things that you accuse yourself of. And you start to apologize to other people for being what you think you are. As if God looks at you that way. And then you start to punish yourself for having the weaknesses that you think are just who you are the way that you were made and that there's no way forward. And you just start to live in that shame and you start to live in that guilt. But I need you to know that when God looks at you, he's not seeing your mistakes. He's not seeing your failures. He's not seeing your shortcomings. This is the grace of God that we would receive what we don't deserve. We don't deserve God to look at us and see perfection, but he does. Amen. You get to walk in that freedom. Do you realize how ridiculous it would be? For God to accuse you of the very thing he sent his son to save you from? Think about that. God sent his son, Jesus, to save you from your sin. How ridiculous would it be for God to then call you a sinner and accuse you? 
And it just makes me wonder, if God's not accusing us of being sinners, why are we so quick to accuse others? But I got another point. I got to keep moving. (laughs) Verse 34. Who then is the one who condemns no one? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Here's our fourth point of freedom. You are free from condemnation. God has paid your debt. Free from condemnation. You are free from condemnation. You are not condemned. Condemned is to sentence you to punishment. Paul also says in Romans that the wages of sin is death. As humanity separate from God, we have a death sentence hanging over our heads. And when you live in condemnation, condemnation pushes you down. It weighs on your shoulders. It hangs over your head. You live in fear. You live in doubt. And just think about it. If you have 30 days before reporting to prison for a life sentence, every single moment of those 30 days, you would be counting down to what would effectively be the end of your freedom. Every day, every hour, every minute, every moment, hanging over your head, the sentence is coming, one day closer to the inevitable, one moment less as a free human. But God, this is where you're free from condemnation, the wages of sin and death, but God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross so that he could pay the penalty for our sins, death. We are free from that. But here's the important point I want you to get from this. We are not just saved by Jesus' death. Okay, that is good. That's really important. We are also saved by Jesus' life because he is constantly interceding for us on our behalf to God. Okay, let let me explain that a little bit. We are saved by Jesus' death because he paid the price for our sins. But do you remember the rest of the story? He was raised to life. What happened after he was raised to life? He is now seated at the right hand of God, interceding for us on our behalf. What does interceding mean? He is acting as our agent in the ear of God. And Dehan preached about this a couple weeks ago beautifully. He is in the ear of God with the Holy Spirit in the other ear of God, advocating for us, defending us, vouching for us. When you have a setback, when you mess up, when you have a mistake, when you have a failure, the fear is that, now I ruined it, condemnation's back, (sighs) got to be punished for that one. But what I want you to realize is you're free from those thoughts because even through failure, Jesus is in the ear of God going, no, 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 Katie, that's my precious daughter. I'm advocating for her. I'm defending her. She's so great. I died for her. She's so righteous. She's good. She's holy. Let her keep going. He's advocating for you. He's defending you even when you don't feel like defending yourself. He's fighting for you. He's vouching for you. So as you feel that condemnation, you feel like you should be punished, realize that God is advocating for you on your behalf. You are free from condemnation. God wants you to live a life of freedom, not just knowing that you don't have a sentence awaiting you, but that God is actively advocating to God on your behalf. Amen? That brings us to number five. Who shall separate us from the love of of Christ. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Here's your fifth point of freedom. Free from rejection, God will never leave you. Free from rejection, God will never leave you. What a daring challenge, by the way. Who shall separate us? What a daring challenge to the enemies of God. Dangle the carrot to them. Go ahead and try. Go ahead and try. Bring your best. You want to try to bring hell? God already went down there and took the keys. And I think so much about being free from rejection is defining the win. Defining what is important. So much about being free from rejection is defining the win. Here's what I mean. When I was in college... I played basketball, and we had a game at a school called West Virginia, Morgantown, West Virginia. And big game. They were a really good team. We were a really bad team. Seemed like 30 seconds into the game, we're down 30 points. 
Sounds bad, but actually for me, for the guys at the very end of the bench who don't play well, I mean to play a lot, <laughs> or both, <laughs> that's good for me. Because if we're down 30, guess who's getting in the game? Guess who's getting in the game? So sure enough, five minutes left in the game, down 35. Jay, check in. Bam, I'm in. And let me tell you something. When you're in my position, when you're sitting in that 12th seat down at the end of the bench and you get in the game, you don't know when that moment's coming again. You shoot your shot. You, you're going to shoot your shot. So I check in. I'm ready. Ah, rebound. Boom, pass. Ah, jumper. Bah, good. Let's go. Pump fake. Ah, free throws. I'm all over it. Now, we're down 35 with like three minutes left. Guys aren't even trying hard. They're not, they just want to go home. Fans are leaving. I don't care. Rebound. Ah, pump fake. Do the legs. Ah, step back. Gotcha. Boom. You got to shoot your shot. After the game, shaking hands. Ah, got a pep in my step. My team's head's low. I'm, ah, we go. Coach, other team, shakes my hand. Son, you played really well. Yeah, I did, coach. Thank you. I'm walking to the locker room. I had seven points and four rebounds. Uh, uh, I had seven points. I hit a three-pointer. Oh, we're sad right now, right? <laughs> Sitting down in the locker room, handing out pizzas. Coach yelling at the team. I had seven points, three rebounds. Because I knew what the win to me was. I didn't care if we lost by 35. I didn't care if we went 0-30. I wanted to get in the game. If I got in the game, Travis, and I scored, I'm winning. And the thing about our love with Jesus and his love for us is that, is that the win is not your love for Jesus. Okay, because there's going to be moments when you're going to doubt your faith. There's going to be moments when you're going to ask really tough questions. And, and answering those questions, it, it might take a year to reconcile that. And there may be days when you just don't feel like loving God. Or you're mad at him because you asked for something and he didn't give it to you. But your win is not your love for God. Your win is his love for you. And what, what does that mean? When you've defined your win as God's love for you, and you understand that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ, you want to walk me through a hardship, you want to take me through a valley, you want to take me through a difficult season, that's fine because I'm still singing and I'm still excited because nothing shall separate me from the love of Christ. I know I may walk through the shadow of the valley of death, but he, I will fear no evil. That's how you live in freedom, knowing that nothing shall separate you from the love of Christ. You recognize you have some brokenness in your life? Declare the win. God still loves me. I am still worthy for Jesus to die on the cross for me. Come on, y'all should be more excited about this because you need to remind yourself, even if you're in a place where you're feeling discouraged, you're still winning. I know the relationship didn't work out for you. You're still winning. I know you experienced some brokenness in your life. You're still winning. And sometimes you just got to remind yourself of that fact before you start being a negative Nancy and walking around in your rain cloud. Just puddle of pity because everything's not working out for me. And I've been going to church, but I can't catch a break at my job. Guess what? You're still winning. If nothing ever good happens to you for the rest of your life and you feel like you just get bad thing after bad thing after bad thing, you're still winning. You get eternity and the love of Jesus Christ forever in heaven. You're still winning. You are free at last. And now, now we get to that beautiful statement. We're free from fear. We're free from worry. We're living free from judgment. We're living free from condemnation. We're living free from rejection. Now, what do we make of it? In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Would you stand with me here as I close? Because I want to explain something that's really, really important in this message. I really want you to understand this just closing thought. In order to be a conqueror, 
you must go through conflict. So will you be fearful in life? Yeah. You're going to be really scared sometimes. And, and you're going to be full of fear. And that's okay because God is for you and you are more than an overcomer. Will you worry? Yeah. Probably more than you ever care to admit and probably about things that when looking back you realize never deserved a moment of your thought life. But guess what? God will provide. You are more than a conqueror. Will you be judged? Yeah. And, and you'll, be, you'll be judged and accused by people that you thought loved you. And it will hurt, and it will burn, and it will sever some relationships in your life. But know this, God sees you as righteous. You are more than an overcomer. Will you be condemned? Yeah. Yeah, some days you're going to feel like you deserve it. Some days you're going to feel like, man, I just, I just don't even deserve the love of God right now. I really just deserve to be punished. Why do I keep making the same mistake? Why do I find myself back in church asking forgiveness for the same thing week after week, night after night? Guess what? God has freed you from condemnation, and you are more than a conqueror. Y'all hearing me? Will you be rejected? Yeah. Honestly, you'll probably be rejected in life more than you're accepted. And it will hurt. But walk in the freedom knowing that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. And you are more than a conqueror. Amen? Can I pray for you? Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, as we take this moment just to rest in your presence. I ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit please move amongst us. Make us aware of your presence. I can feel you working, Holy Spirit. People that walked in in bondage to fear and in bondage to judgment and accusation, in bondage to judgment, being set free. God, do for us what we can't do for ourselves. Come on, move amongst your people. I want to give an opportunity for those who say, well, I'm at peace with God, but I didn't, I didn't realize I could be a child of God. And I've been coming to a church for a long time, but I didn't, I didn't realize that I actually could live in freedom as a son and a daughter of God. And I want to come home, God. I'm tired of living bound up. I'm tired of living in bondage. I want to live the life of freedom that you have for me, and I want to live it abundantly. I want to be alive in you, Jesus. And for anybody that has never declared Jesus as their Lord and Savior and accepted the free gift of grace from God, I want to give you that opportunity this morning, and I want to pray for you. If you want to declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning, would you just, just lift your hand just so I know who I'm praying for? Just slip it up. Slip it up so I know who I'm praying for. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for moving this morning. I, th I thank you for these lives that are coming home. I thank you for the children that you've called home, Father. And secondly, Father, I want to ask you, Lord, for those this morning that have been feeling like there's just a weight hanging over their heads, that there's something hanging on their shoulders. God, I want you to free them this morning. I want them to feel free to be alive in you, Jesus. I want you to free them from fear this morning. Free them from judgment. Free them from worry. Free them from condemnation, God. Free them from rejection, Lord, that they would live the life that you have for them, God. That they would be inspired to pursue the dreams that you've put in their life. Be inspired to wake up every day and be alive and be excited and be enthusiastic and live with anticipation and expectation about what you might do through them, God. Please go with us, Father. We love you, and in your name I pray. Come on, church, say it with me. Amen and amen.